My name is uh, Stephen Pfeiffer. I am currently a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, previously, I spent 27 years as a career foreign service officer serving in Warsaw, Moscow, London, and then my last overseas assignment was as the American ambassador to Ukraine at the end of the 1990s. Uh, my book is called uh, The Eagle and the Trident, U.S.-Ukraine Relations in Turbulent Times, and what it does is it takes a very close look at U.S.-Ukraine relations from 1991 to 2004. And that was a period when I was working on Ukraine either at the State Department, the National Security Council, or at the American Embassy in Ukraine. Uh, and in writing the book, I was able to get access to my notes from my time at the National Security Council. I, for example, went down to the Clinton Library in Little Rock, got access to notes there. Uh, the State Department generously helped me get access to notes from my time in Kiev and such. And then I was able to get that material declassified for use in the book. The book then has a shorter uh, look at what happened in U.S.-Ukraine relations from 2005 up to the present. And it's a short look because that was a point where I'd shifted from becoming a participant to becoming an observer. And then the end of the book takes a look at what lessons did we learn, what things worked in terms of advancing the American vision for a Ukraine that was going to be a stable, independent, democratic state with a strong market economy, and what things didn't work, and then what were, would be recommendations for more effective policy on the American side to try to help Ukraine become the sort of country and the partner that we'd like to see. For many in Washington, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 caught people by surprise. Uh, and so it wasn't as if there was a ready-made policy approach on the part of the George H.W. Bush administration to deal with this. Uh, by the second half of 1991, it was very clear that the Soviet Union was in its last days, and the administration struggled to come up with a policy. But I'd say that in initially, the decision was and this was the right decision, was to recognize all of the republics that emerged from the wreckage of the Soviet Union. And then Secretary Baker made the decision that if we're going to treat these states as truly independent states, let's establish diplomatic relations, and that means getting embassies on the ground. And that was a bit easier in Kiev because we already were in the process of establishing a consulate there. So we already had a small presence in Kiev. And that consulate then became an embassy uh, when relations were formally established in January of 1992. But for much of the early first two years of U.S.-Ukraine relations, the American focus really was on nuclear weapons issues. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine had on its territory what was the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world, including almost 2,000 strategic nuclear warheads designed to strike the United States, uh, something like 175 intercontinental ballistic missiles, 45 strategic bombers. And the American focus was eliminating those because Washington did not want to see the collapse of the Soviet Union lead to three or four nuclear powers in the space of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and Russia at that point had the largest arsenal, and there was sort of acceptance here that Russia was the larger logical country to maintain the nuclear weapons. Um, and so that was the focus of U.S. policy. I, I guess looking back, I'd say Washington probably in the first 18 months to two years made a mistake in dealing with Ukraine in that it focused so heavily on nuclear weapons. And what American policy did probably was uh, give in Ukraine the incorrect perception that once the nuclear weapons were gone, there wouldn't be much basis for a U.S.-Ukraine relationship. And, and the, the, the Clinton administration in the second half of 1993 really worked to correct that and make the point that, look, once the nuclear weapons are gone, there are lots of reasons for a U.S.-Ukraine relationship. First of all, Ukraine is going to be a big part of shaping a more stable Europe. Uh, the, the, the catchphrase that the Bush or the George H.W. Bush administration used was a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, second, in Ukraine, with at the time over 45 million people, there were uh, 50 million people at the time, Ukraine was seen as a p potential market, so there was potential for economic interaction. And then third, there was also a sense that Ukraine could be a partner on other non-proliferation challenges. For example, not only eliminating nuclear weapons, but also controlling ballistic missile technology. Uh, and, and, and so by the second half of... Um, 1993, particularly when Secretary Christopher went to Kiev in October of 1993, American were diplomats were beginning to say, look, the nuclear weapons are important, but they fit in a broader U.S. approach.
I think the mistake was in focusing so heavily on the nuclear weapons in the first 18 to 24 months is we may have, in fact, inflated their importance and in some ways may have made it more difficult to get rid of them. Well, well, certainly, I think Washington regarded the elimination of the nuclear weapons in Ukraine as a major foreign policy success. Because remember, we were talking about eliminating 2,000 strategic warheads that were built, designed to to strike American cities, to strike military targets in the United States. Um, When we engaged the Ukrainians on the question... Uh, first point was that I, Ukraine was inclined to get rid of the nuclear weapons. Uh, if you go back and look at, for example, the Ukrainian Declaration of State Sovereignty in the summer of 1990, it talks about Ukraine as a non-nuclear weapon state. But the negotiation that took place first between the Russians and the Ukrainians and then took place between the Russians, the Americans, and the Ukrainians when the process became a trilateral one was could the United States and Russia provide acceptable answers to several understandable questions that the Ukrainians had. One was, uh, given that the Ukrainian economy was contracting at a fairly alarming rate, uh, who would fund the eliminations of the missiles and the bombers and such? And and the United States' answer to that was, we have the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Basically, the United States will pay for that. A second question was, uh, the nuclear warheads actually have value in that they contain highly enriched uranium, you can take that down and blend it to low enriched uranium and use that for power, for fuel for nuclear power plants. So a second question was, how do we ensure that Ukraine gets its share of the value of that highly enriched uranium? And we came up with a solution working with the Russians on that. And then the third question, and my sense was probably the most important question for Ukrainians was that nuclear weapons have security value. And if the nuclear weapons are gone... Uh, what is the guarantee, the assurance for Ukrainian security? And that, that's where the Budapest Memorandum came in. And in the Budapest Memorandum, which was signed in 1994, in December of 1994, the United States, Russia, and Britain committed to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity, its sovereignty, its independence. Uh, they agreed not to use force or the threat of force against Ukraine. They agreed not to use economic coercion against Ukraine. Uh, All of these uh, assurances have been grossly violated by the Russians over the course of the last three years. Now, we did say assurances, uh, and and that was actually an important distinction, which we did make clear to Ukraine at the time. We in Washington were not prepared to extend security guarantees because the term guarantee to American ears, it means something like what we have with our NATO allies or Japan or South Korea, which is basically a military guarantee that says if you get into trouble, the 82nd Airborne is available to come and support you. And and we told Ukraine that the United States was not prepared to make the, that kind of commitment. Uh, there was a sense here that that would not be approved by Congress. Uh, so we talked about assurances, which were basically a statement saying we're going to take an interest and we will care if there's a violation. Um, now, I think if you look back at the Obama administration, the Obama administration did a lot to support Ukraine in the aftermath of Ukraine, uh, of Russia's illegal seizure of Crimea. But I would make sort of two criticisms, which, which I did make a, a, a couple of years ago, was that one, when the Obama administration talked about why it was doing things like sanctions on Russia, why it was increasing assistance to Ukraine, it didn't talk about the Budapest Memorandum. And that, to my mind, answered the question that I'd often get. You go out outside of Washington and you talk to Americans and you get the question, why should we care about Ukraine? It's 5,000 miles away. We've got lots of other foreign policy problems. And part of my answer to that was because of the Budapest Memorandum. In 1994, we told Ukraine that we would care. And we told Ukraine that we would care in part to get something that was very important to the United States, which was the elimination of those 2,000 nuclear weapons. So, in a sense, uh, I see that the United States has an obligation. And, again, the Obama administration, they could have talked about that more regularly in a way that would have answered that question. And then my my second criticism would be that the Obama administration could have done more. Uh, The particular shortcoming I see was in the area of military assistance, where there could have been more military assistance to Ukraine and um, I would have relaxed the rule on no lethal assistance specifically to provide Ukraine with uh, man-portable anti-armor weapons. Um, 
Now, I, I'd make one other comment. Um, I do, when I return to Ukraine, uh, I hear a lot about the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, people know that I was part of the American negotiating team that, that worked on that. And I certainly understand Ukrainians today saying, look, uh, things would be very different if we hadn't signed the Budapest Memorandum, if we'd kept some nuclear weapons. And you know, that's, that's hard to disprove. I mean, alternative histories are not easy to define. But what I would say is that there also would have been some very significant cost to Ukraine. And, and, and part of my book looks at what happened in what you might call the golden period in U.S.-Ukraine relations from 1995 through 1998, where with the nuclear weapons issue behind the countries, and that was over and settled, you saw a real expansion of U.S.-Ukraine relations. So in 1996, you had the declaration of a strategic partnership between Washington and Kiev, and that was supported by the creation of a binational commission headed by Ukrainian President Kuchma and the U.S. Vice President Al Gore. Uh, you had lots of visits. In 1997, President Kuchma came to the United States four times. So you had that very strong tightening of relations between the United States and Ukraine at the top. That wouldn't have happened had Ukraine kept on nuclear weapons. Other things would not have happened. Uh, in 1994, Ukraine had got a partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union. In 1997, Ukraine got a distinctive uh, partnership with uh, NATO, which established a standing NATO-Ukraine body. None of that would have happened had Ukraine kept nuclear weapons. And on the economic side, uh, had Ukraine gone, as I think Ukraine would have had to do, had it gone to the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or the European Bank uh, for Reconstruction and Development looking for low-interest loans, my guess is a Ukraine with nuclear weapons would have found that the executive directors on those institutions from the United States and Europe would have opposed that. So I can understand the desire now looking back to say things might have been different in 2014 had Ukraine held on nu to nuclear weapons, but there would have been substantial political and economic costs, and, and Ukraine would have found itself, I think, much more isolated from the West. Perhaps not a pariah state in the same way that North Korea is, uh, but Ukraine would not have been a welcome partner had it tried to keep those nuclear weapons. Well, that was actually one of the fun parts about writing this book was, again, uh, a lot of it was... You know, history, again, based on notes that I had taken at the time. But then at the end of the first five, I think, or six chapters, I actually have a section entitled Reflections. You know, looking back, you know, 20 years later, uh, what things worked, what things didn't work. And then that sort of begins then to feed into the last chapter, which has an overall summary of lessons learned and recommendations. Uh, but tonight, I think there were some things that we came to appreciate. It was, for example, on a reflection, looking back a couple of years after uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons that, in my own mind, and, and uh, this was something I came to inclusion probably in 1997, that we had focused too heavily on the nuclear weapons issue, that there might have been a way, better way for American diplomacy to achieve that result, you know, but also get an earlier start at beginning to shape a broader U.S.-Ukraine relationship. Um, you know, looking back on things like um, addressing Ukraine's concern, which was made very clear to us back in the uh, fall of 1994 when uh, then Deputy Foreign Minister Boris Tarasuk came to Washington and said, look, uh, we see NATO getting ready to enlarge and we think at some point in the next few years we're going to have NATO on our western border. We see the Russians very unhappy to the east. What's the vision for Ukraine? Uh, where do we fit? Are we in a gray zone of insecurity? Uh, and then going back and taking a look, and in the end, that was an area where I think we got the right answers. I mean, we expanded the bilateral links between Washington and Kiev. We encouraged our European allies to do the same. We built the NATO-Ukraine relationship to try to build a web of linkages that would make Ukraine feel that it had an anchor to the West, that it wasn't sort of free-floating between an enlarging NATO and enlarging European Union to the West and an angry Russia to the East. Uh, one of the things that we have to think about now is, given the current situation, we sort of have that problem. Are there ways to, do, to think through that? And I, I didn't have time in the book to sort of address that question because that's still an evolving problem. Um, I, I think one uh, area where I look back now and say we in the West or we in the United States didn't understand uh, as much as we should have was just the nature of corruption in Ukraine. And certainly when I was there in the late 90s, we understood there was a lot of corruption, but we probably didn't grasp just how deeply it permeated you know, every uh, layer of the political culture. And, and 
and what a problem that was going to be for the sorts of reforms that Ukraine had to make to build a truly open political system and a competitive market economy. Uh, so I look back and I say, probably in the 90s, we should have pushed harder on reforms. Uh, we should have been more blunt. Uh, and that's awfully not easy to do. When you have two presidents in the room, they want to be diplomatic. Um, but, but I think sometimes we probably, on our side, softened the words. And then when they were translated from English into Ukrainian, maybe the edge was taken away. And, and, and we probably should have been tougher and more transactional because we were, we were trying to get Ukraine to do things that looking back now, I realize there were just a lot of incentives for Ukraine's leadership not to move on. And I'll give one example of the example, and this is in part, I think, due to corruption, but also just in part due to political sensitivities. In 2016, uh, the Ukrainian government finally raised the tariffs charged for heat and electricity to households to a level where it covers the cost of producing and delivering that heat and electricity. Um, that was something we were pushing for back in the 1990s. And, and, and we said, look, we understand this is going to hit every household. The way to take care of those households for whom this is going to be a real hardship is then you set aside a fund that you subsidize those lower income households. Uh, Ukraine took 20 years to do that. And by some estimates, the cost of the, to the government of subsidizing or, those households came to about 6% of gross domestic product. That was a huge drain on the budget. But leader after leader after leader did not want to do that because it meant hitting every household in the country with a, with a tariff increase. And that was not good politics. Uh, but it's one of the things that held Ukraine back. And, and looking back now, I think, had we pushed Ukraine harder and had we been able to help Ukraine get to a point where it made changes like that, you know, in the late 1990s or the early 2000s, you would have had a stronger, more resilient society that would have been better prepared to withstand the pressures that Ukraine has faced from Russia since uh, 2014. I think it was probably in the summer of 1998. Uh, I hosted a dinner at the residence. One of the things I used to like to do, and I, and I talk about uh, this in the book, is um, I would periodically have a dinner where it would be built around a theme. And, and so at this particular dinner, the theme was Ukraine's national security. So we had several deputy ministers of defense and foreign affairs, uh, some members of the parliament. Uh, we had some uh, people from the National Security and Defense Council, and we had some think tankers. And I guess about halfway through the dinner, I said, okay, let me pose a question. That is, what is the single greatest threat to Ukrainian national security today? There's a pause. Someone at the end of the table says, Ukrainians. And we all laughed. But then there was kind of a really interesting discussion where it came out that, you know, this was a discussion in 1990 saying the biggest single threat to Ukraine was the inability of Ukraine to come up with a strategic vision. You know, what's the goal? How do you get there? And then have a plan to implement that. And, and that at that time was seen by this table as a bigger threat than any outside threat. Uh, obviously, since 2013, 2014, uh, clearly Russia is a huge threat. But it's there really are these two threats that sort of reflect the two problems that Ukraine needs to address today. One is, how does it rebut, defend against, deter Russian aggression, particularly in eastern Ukraine now, but there's also the longer-term question of Crimea. But at the same time, while doing that, how does it go through with the reforms make those reforms, in fact, implemented in a way that makes Ukraine a more successful state, a state that looks more like a European state following the path of, say, Poland and the Baltic states. And so uh, overcoming those two challenges are really the big thing that Ukraine has to overcome in order to succeed, in my view. Um, my first comment would be, uh, if the Central Intelligence Agency was that good, you know, we'd run the world. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, and in some ways, I think that's actually disparaging of Ukrainians. I mean, this idea this is somehow orchestrated from outside. I mean, both the Maidan Revolution and the Orange Revolution were, to my mind, I mean, these were manifestations of the Ukrainian population saying, we're not going to stand for a stolen election. We're not going to stand for increasingly authoritarian governance. Uh, and the civil society movement, those sorts of, I mean, that was, that was a great thing. 
uh, and it's disparaging of Ukraine to say, well, that really wasn't your doing. That was a plot by you know, the Americans and the British and the Germans. Uh, the problem I think we have, uh, and Ukraine has, is the way Vladimir Putin talks about what happened in the Orange Revolution and the Maidan Revolution. I begin to think he truly believes that these were, in fact, organized, or orchestrated by Western intelligence services. And it's a reflection of the fact that he may not well understand Ukraine. Um, and that's problematic because it leads to policies uh, that may well have unintended consequences. Uh, my impression from my time in Ukraine in the late 1990s was, while you certainly had people who were Ukrainian nationalists, aside from a certain small portion of the population, it didn't have a strong anti-Russian element. Uh, you can a lot of people say, yes, we believe in Ukraine, we want to celebrate our culture and our language and our heritage, but, you know, we want Russia as a neighbor. Uh, what Russia has done under President Putin's leadership in the last few years has changed that in, in a very dramatic way, where I think you have a generation of Ukrainians now who are very strongly anti-Russian, which is understandable given what Russia has done to Ukraine in the past three and a half years. Well, I think the advice, my advice for the American administration was, um, it would be, the way I describe it in the book is what I call a tougher love approach. And that is, we have to push harder, we have to be more blunt in our expectations that Ukraine will in, implement reform. And we have to be more transactional in saying, look, we're prepared to provide this assistance, but only when you've done A, B, or C. And then make sure that A, B, and C are accomplished before we provide the assistance. Now, that's the tough part. The love part is, and I think this would be for the United States and the West, if you had a, a government in Kiev that was prepared to push really fast on reform, it then would strike me as in the interest of the West to actually provide greater assistance. To the extent that we can get Ukraine more quickly to the place where it doesn't need assistance, but in fact then draws on investment and becomes a normal growing economy, that's in the interest of the West. So that would be my message here. And, and my message in Kiev would be you, you have to do things that are going to be hard and you have to do things that so far it appears that at Bankova they're not really prepared to do. Uh, and that means a serious anti-corruption effort. Uh, it means, and this is already required by the International Monetary Fund uh, for uh, further tranches of their program. It means serious pension reform. It means land reform. One, one of the accomplishments, I think, that we recorded when I was in Ukraine in the 1990s was on a number of the collective farms, we were able to go in and do land titling where we could help the Ukrainians divide up a farm and say, and then tell somebody, here's a piece of paper. And it says from that bridge to that road to that tree, that is your property. Uh, and that was a big start. And it was fascinating. I guess it was probably in 2001 I recall flying into Kiev, and this is uh, the first time after I had departed as ambassador, and just looking down from the airplane as we were coming into Borispil Airport, you could tell by the tilling patterns in the land that these large collective farms had been broken up into individual plots. But what hasn't happened is they haven't created a mechanism that allows the free sale of the land. And what that means is farmers can't put up land as collateral to get a mortgage to get more capital that they could then use to buy a tractor or better seeds or better inputs. And th this is, was the basis for uh, American small farms in the early 1900s, was that ability to put up land for sale to get a mortgage gave them the capital to grossly improve their productivity and become successful. And although the land's been titled, you know, 20 years later, if the farmers can't sell it or use it as collateral, it really inhibits their ability to draw on the capital that would make Ukraine usually successful as an agricultural power. The, the book does try to report in detail the sorts of interactions between Washington and Kyiv, and I tried to sort of give a sense for what were the motivations between American policy. What was the United States trying to achieve? I, I try to discuss some of the difficulties, and, and I think there were mistakes on the American side. There were also difficulties on the Ukrainian side. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we found was sometimes the Ukrainian government could be dysfunctional. Uh, and I, one of the examples I cited in the book was at one point in time, uh, we were giving the Ukrainian military uh, maybe seven to eight million dollars a year so that it could buy fuel and oil and, and diesel 
for the Ukrainian military so that they could train and that they could then take part in exercises with the U.S. military. Uh, what happened, we found, was that uh, that seven or eight million dollars each year it was being taxed by the state tax administration. This was going to drive the American Congress nuts. You know, when the Congress said eight million dollars is going to Ukrainians' military, and they found that the Ukrainian military was only going to get six and a half million because the rest was going to be taxes. And I had to explain in lots of different places. Look, it's not a matter of the size of the slice of the pie that the state tax administration is getting. The question is, you're not going to get a pie. It's, and we were actually worried that Congress then might move to cut off more assistance. And the frustrating thing was, I, you know, I raised the Ministry of Defense, I raised the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the National Security and Defense Council. We couldn't find anybody who could fix this problem and sit, step back and say, okay, the state tax administration has to give up that money because this is $8 million that's coming to the Ministry of Defense that they're not going to get anywhere else. And it was only when we threatened to cut that money off and then invoke some other sanctions that we'd get the Ukrainian government to respond properly. That, that was a bit frustrating. Uh, and, and there were there are just other times, too, where I, I guess a problem that we sometimes had was we seemed to talk past each other. I, I remember early on in 1998, uh, in some of my first meetings, one of the points I tried to make with my Ukrainian interlocutors was, please don't tell me or the U.S. government yes on a question when you can't deliver or you may not want to deliver. Because the problem is when we hear a yes and then six months later there's been no follow-through, it's it's a much bigger problem for U.S.-Ukraine relations than if you just told us no in the first place. And, and uh, an example uh, that I write about in the book was um, in the summer of 2001, in July of 2001, um, Condoleezza Rice, then the National Security Advisor, went to Kiev. And this was the first high-level uh, official of the George W. Bush administration to go to Ukraine. Uh, and she met with President Kuchma. And at the time, um, the issue was that Ukraine was providing heavy weapons to the Macedonian military. This was at a point where the Macedonian was on the brink of civil war. And NATO was getting ready to put in a stabilization force on the ground in Macedonia. NATO didn't want to see more weapons coming in because NATO forces didn't want to get caught in the middle of some kind of a major battle. So uh, uh, the National Security Advisor, Dr. Rice, asked President Kuchma, please stop this. President Kuchma said he will. Uh, the Ukrainians didn't stop sending the weapons until eight or nine months later. And I'm not sure they understood just how much damage that did to President Kuchma's reputation in Washington at the start of the Bush administration, you know, when we said we have, you know, the President Kuchma told Dr. Rice the transfers are going to end, and then we continue to see the weapons flow into Macedonia. And and, 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 and that was a problem. And again, where we, we had a yes, we thought it was a, an issue that was resolved, and then it wasn't, and then it became a bigger problem. Uh, I guess another issue where we, I, I think things, had it been played differently, they could have minimized this problem, but it was probably the issue in 2002 that really brought U.S.-Ukraine relations to a low point. And it was the question of uh, the Kalchuga air defense system. Um, in, I guess, the first part of 2002, uh, of course, this was the case where there were a number of recordings that had been made in President Kuchma's office in 2000 and 2001, which were then released. Uh, we were told that there was a recording uh, that had President Kuchma agreeing to the transfer of the Kalchuga air defense system, or the sale of the Kalchuga air defense system, by a Ukrainian defense plant to Iraq. The problem with the Kalchuga is it's not a normal radar system. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't emit a radar beam but it tracks airplanes uh, by their radio and radar emissions. And, and so it creates a situation where you, know, you can, the Kalchuga does the tracking, you catch an American or a British plane, and both at that time, American and British planes were regularly flying over Iraq under conditions agreed by the UN Security Council. Uh, that plane won't know it's being tracked. And so you could fire a missile at that plane, and then at the last second, turn on an active radar to guide the missile to the plane, and the pilot would only have, you know, seconds to react. Uh, this was something that we took very seriously. Uh, we received the recording. We uh, 
turned it over to uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, they worked on it and came back to us and said, look, we've looked at this with the help of several other agencies. We all agree, one, that there's nothing on this recording to suggest that it's been spliced together or that it's a fake. We believe it's genuine. And they said, and everyone else agrees that that, that voice is that of uh, President Kuchma. Uh, so we raised this. Uh, this was of concern. Uh, the Ukrainians said, well, let's have an American-British team, the, the two countries flying over at, come to Kiev, and we will convince you that this didn't happen. And I remember having a lunch with um, the Ukrainian ambassador here, that was Ambassador Hishchenko, and Deputy Foreign Minister Alexander Chali, who was visiting from Kiev, and I said, you know, it's really hard to prove a negative. And I, for me, the big question to that team is going to be, when you come back, do you feel that everybody was completely transparent with you? That, that Because I, I'm not sure they can prove the negative, but you know, what I want to do is hear when you come back, that you had every possible assistance. And when the team came back, their assessment was, look, when we talked to the foreign ministry and the Ministry of Defense, we got everything we asked for. They couldn't have been more open. But they said, when we talked to the National Security and Defense Council, when we talked to the SBU, the Security Service of Ukraine, uh, we didn't get that cooperation. And so, for example, uh, the team was told that the Security Service of Ukraine had done a big investigation that this concluded it didn't happen. And they said, and we, they'd even written a report on it. Uh, and when they said, well, can we have a copy of the report? Well, the report came with several sections redacted. <laughs> and so the question is, well, what's in those sections? Um, the, during the visit by our team, uh, though it was confirmed that at the day and the time the recording allegedly was made, uh, the person that President Kuchma was talking to was in his office. Uh, so there, there was a, a certain amount of concern, and this had a political effect. That basically, the United States and NATO then said, "Look, under these circumstances, we're not prepared." At the upcoming NATO summit, which is going to be held in Prague in November of 2002, we're not prepared to have a NATO-Ukraine summit. Uh, we're going to reduce that down ministerial because we're very concerned about what President Kuchma might have done, uh, and, and that really. The idea that President Kuchma in 2000 would have said yes to this when we thought our relationship was at a high point really was some of a shock. Now, I remember, and I, and I, and I put this into the book, uh, you know, and then talking to a couple of people pre close to President Kuchma, and they said, you know, do you know how President Kuchma is? He often says no, and then he goes back and he corrects it. And, and that sounded perfectly possible to me. And, and if I had to guess what happened, he said yes, as on the recording, and then somehow later on went back and said, no, that, don't do that, stop it. Because as we learned when the American military was in Iraq, we never found evidence that the Kalchukas had actually been transferred. Um, and, but had the Ukrainians at the beginning told us, look, the president said yes to get this guy out of the office, but then, of course, he wasn't going to do it. Yeah. And he told them later on, no, I mean, that would have been plausible to us. And so I remember talking to the people close to President Kush when they said this. I said, you know, uh, that may well have happened, but nobody's told us that that's happened. That, ha that explanation hasn't been there. Uh, and you know, had the Ukrainians come out and said, look, the president said yes, but didn't mean it, no, nothing had ever acted on it, we would have been a bit unhappy that his inclination was to say yes. But it wouldn't have become the problem for the relationship that Kalchuga came to the point where even at the end of 2002, or I guess it was the beginning of 2003, in his sort of New Year's um, press conference, President Kuchma says, you know, one of the biggest uh, losses of the year was the decline in the U.S.-Ukraine relationship. And, and that was something that really was only fixed when uh, President Kuchma in 2003 was prepared uh, to commit uh, Ukrainian military forces to the stabilization force in Iraq. That didn't repair all the damage, but at least it allowed a connection to be maintained and kept the relationship from spinning totally out of control. I think actually today, and even when I was there, you know, my sense was that there was a cohesive idea of Ukraine as Ukraine. Uh, one of the reasons why um, I'm very negative on what the Russians are doing in Donbass is that when I was there in the late 90s and traveled to places like Donetsk and Dnipropetrovsk and Kharkiv and Mariupol, and you would talk to people, you got a sense that even though 
you know, they wanted to speak Russian, they wanted to have good relations with Russian, there still was this sense, and it wasn't nearly as deep as it was in Western Ukraine, but that they were Ukrainians, that they saw it as the country ran into trouble, they would deal with it as Ukraine. Uh, and, and I think that's only become much deeper throughout the country over the course of the last couple of years, given what the Russians have done. So I, I, I think that sense of national identity has come around. It was developing already in the 90s. Um, this is one of the unintended consequences of uh, the Kremlin's war against Ukraine, is that they have solidified that idea. But the corruption issue is, is a big one. And, and, and as I write about in the book, uh, we probably didn't recognize it uh, to be as deep a problem as we might have in the early 1990s. And had we done so, we, put, we could have pushed harder. And, and maybe become more insistent. Now, at the end of the day, I, I'm not sure how much success we would have had. Um, part of the question was, you know, one of the tools we had was U.S. assistance, which ran, when I was there, about $225 million a year for uh, reform support and additional amounts of money for nuclear safety at Chernobyl and for the Ukrainian military and for illuminating the nuclear weapons infrastructure. You know, but most of that money was going to non-governmental actors. And so sometimes I think the threat of losing that money probably didn't motivate people in government uh, as much as it might have, in part because some of those people had connections and, and that were much more profitable. So, so getting that mechanism right to change calculations. Uh, we should have pushed Ukraine harder, though, on basically being more serious about rooting out corruption, which from my impression in the late 90s, was pretty much a risk-free activity. We didn't see many reports of Ukrainians either being caught uh, in corrupt activities and then being tried and actually facing real consequences in the terms of fines or imprisonment. I mean, in the 1990s and early 2000s, the most notable uh, Ukrainian official uh, who ended up going to jail for corruption, you know, was not uh, arrested and tried in Ukraine. He was arrested and tried in the United States. And that was Pavel Lazarenko, who, uh, when he learned, yeah, I believe he was in Greece at the time, this would have been in 1999, um, he learned that the uh, parliament, the Rada, had stripped him of his, uh, of his immunity. Uh, and so instead of returning to Ukraine, he came to the United States. Um, and asked for political asylum while he was being held. Being, he was being yeah, he was not allowed to sort of roam freely. He was being held uh, by what was in the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Uh, but then, over the course of time, the Department of Justice investigation concluded that he had moved tens of millions of dollars through U.S. banks on their way to banks in the Caribbean. Uh, and the Department of Justice then built a case uh, for money laundering and and, and related charges. And I, I, my understanding is that Mr. Lazarenko spent about eight years in prison for it. Um, yeah. That was a case where the way the money moved, it was something that the U.S. government could track. And so we had hard evidence. We didn't have as much evidence. We had suspicions, but didn't have hard evidence about a lot of the corruption that took place within Ukraine. And, and my, my sense is that this was something that my Ukrainian interlocutors always thought, well, the Americans must have a lot of knowledge on this. Well, actually, it wasn't you know, a big target for us. We were looking at other things because the corruption issues were mostly violations of Ukrainian law. Uh, when Mr. Lazarenko chose to move his money through the United States, it then became a violation of U.S. law, and the Department of Justice then was prepared to act. But otherwise, there were sort of different situations. Um, and I, I guess the other tool that we used that was hard to use, I think it's become easier to use now because of changes in American executive orders, but was the threat of uh, visa bans. And uh, I guess it was one point in 1999, uh, at the time, uh, under dealing under the uh, U.S. consular rules uh, from the State Department, if we wanted to so and say, we need to ban somebody because we think they're involved in possibly illegal or corrupt activities, the standard of evidence was usually high. Uh, and, and we did it at one point in the early 2000s. Um, we banned Mr. Circus, but it required the preparation of a lot of material. As I, said, I think it's much easier now, but that had an impact. Uh, and I remember back in 1999, um, 
on the eve of the visit by President Kuchma to Washington, I think it was in December of 1999, uh, Yevhen Marchuk, who was at the head of, at the time was the uh, Secretary of the National Security Defense Council, he came to Washington. How do we arrange, and I'm going to talk about this a little more detail in the book, for him to meet with uh, George Tennant, then the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And Mr. Tennant said, here are some people, uh, these folks, you know, were very concerned about, they shouldn't even bother to apply for visas. What was interesting was that we gave those, we gave them the names within three or four days, the Ukrainian press had leaked those names out. And that seemed to have an impact. And my, that was a tool I think we could have used more forcefully, the threat of either visa sanctions or financial sanctions against people who are involved in corrupt activities uh, as a way to put pressure on them and then to discourage them. And that actually is, is one of the recommendations I make at the end is, is maybe if the fight against corruption in Ukraine is not moving more quickly, uh, the U.S. government today ought to be thinking about are there visa and financial sanctions to apply both on people within the Ukrainian government but also to apply uh, against those who are engaged in corrupt activities outside of government, uh, again, as a penalty, but also to begin to find ways to raise the costs to uh, uh, raise the cost of corruption and hopefully dissuade people from engaging in corrupt acts. Uh, you know, this is what I think today really a, a, the, the biggest problem for Ukraine. There's been some progress since President Poroshenko took office three years ago, uh, but my guess is that for most Ukrainians, if you looked at the expectations back in May and June of 2014 and where Ukraine is today uh, in the summer of 2017, uh, there hasn't been as much action uh, to deal with corruption as would have been hoped for and expected. Okay, thanks very much. I'll, I'll just mention that the book, uh, it, uh, The Eagle and the Trident, it, it'll come out, uh, it's released uh, officially at the end of August. I think August 22 is the release date, but... Uh, people can pre-order it now on Amazon. Oh, thank you very much.